Bonjour tout le monde, uh, welcome back uh, everybody, uh, guten morgen. I'm very happy to see you here uh, this morning for the second day of the PKP conference. My name is Tanja Niemann, I am a uh, general director uh, of RED. Um, so my pleasure is uh, this morning to present uh, our um, first speaker of the day. It is Dominique Berube. Uh, Dominique Berube uh, was appointed vice president research programs at the Social Sciences and Humanities Council of Canada in October 2015. And Dominique is very well known in Montreal, actually, uh, because prior to, uh, to joining uh, the council, she was working at University of Montreal for eight years. And to be more precise, she was my boss for eight years. <laughs> so yesterday you met Frederick, who's my current boss, and uh, this morning you will meet uh, Dominic, uh, who was my former boss. Um, Dominic held a variety of positions uh, in, uh, at the University of Montreal, including VP Research, Acting VP Research, Associate VP Research, and she was the Executive uh, Director of the Research Services. So she participated directly in the development and implementation of large-scale research initiatives, including infrastructure and strategic projects. And from my own experience, I can tell you that uh, the support for researchers is really something very important for Dominique, uh, and the quality of this support is uh, a high priority. So through our regular meetings uh, around RAD that I had with her, I think she realized a lot what it means to support independent journals, what it needs, what they need to survive in the, and to perform in a digital environment, in a changing environment. And I would, I would say she experienced actually the, the height and the depth of uh, independent journal publishing in social sciences and humanities. And the impact uh, of publishing initiatives that come out of the universities uh, that are operating for the goals of uh, the academy versus those, uh, as we know, are companies that exist for the benefit of its owners and st stakeholders. So she played a role in the development uh, of the consortium RED, chairing the board of directors from 2012 to 2015. And she strongly supported us uh, in finding strategies for sustainability, um, in fixing strategic orientations, and in encouraging RED to think about new models in support for open access. Dominic holds a PhD in environmental sciences from the University du Québec à Montréal. And on her Twitter account, you can read that she is a fan of arts, science, société et humain, data, and wine. Uh, so I'm very curious to hear Dominique this morning, and uh, please join me to welcome her. I'll just open this. So, merci Tanya uh, pour l'introduction. You just reminded me to check that Twitter account. That is the only thing that I did not accept to uh, remove when I joined Shirk. You know, you're supposed to tweet one tweet in French, one tweet in English, and it's always regulated. So I rather indicated that these tweets are mine only and do not represent, and I still keep it there. But then you say that, and I might look at what I'm usually tweeting there. <laughs> Donc, merci, bonjour à tous. Je voudrais commencer par remercier les organisateurs de la conférence PKP euh, me donner cette occasion de partager avec vous euh, quelques réflexions. I'll reassure the audience immediately. I do not intend to continue in French. <laughs> uh, my, um, uh, my, my boss is not there. They're not watching me right now. But usually we're supposed to do, you know, if I'm in, uh, in Montreal, I'm supposed to do 75% in French, 25% in English. If I'm the uh, rest of Canada, it's the reverse part. But I'll, uh, I'll skip that and I'll keep to English. Though I might reverse uh, to, uh, to French from time to time, sorry, I guess my accent, my Montreal and Quebec roots are always coming back and they really show. In Ottawa, we have that uh, weird habit of switching uh, language in the same sentence, which make it impossible for the official translators <laughs> to do anything. So we'll have time, uh, if you want to, to engage in a discussion at the end of the presentation. 
Uh, of course, I'm uh, uh, tremendously happy to be here uh, today. It's the first conference, of course, of PKP in, uh, in Montreal. And uh, it comes, you know, to support the, uh, the extended collaboration that has been happening uh, with Erudzi, and that was in the, in, in the middle of our thoughts and discussions and work uh, for, the lab, for the 10 years that I, um, that I involved myself uh, in that file. And I know that from the inside, from, uh, from the Erudzi and PKP perspective, Perspectives. It's just a mi another milestone in that long collaboration, but I know the hard work, the compromises, the open minds that it took to get there. And uh, from the outside perspective that I'm now part of, I think you should definitely broadcast uh, this critical success uh, for Canada. I can say honestly that uh, 10 years ago, it was not that obvious that we would get there. <laughs> um, I would also, of course, uh, want to congratulate PKP for the, uh, for the event. I continue to be uh, so impressed by the leadership and the level of excellence and the international impact of this uh, initiative, uh, well illustrated by the list of participants uh, and speakers. Um, so uh, I guess that today, you know, it's, uh, and yeah, it's such a Canadian story, a success story at the international level, and I think we uh, we uh, we have to recognize it uh, more in the, the way that we we put uh, these stories out outside. Um, I'll try to present today, you, today, you know, from a perspective that is a bit re related to the conflict of interest, uh, conflict of interest that Tanya so uh, eloquently uh, evoked. You know, I was involved with. Uh, involved and committed to Erudzi, I might say devotion to Erudzi for uh, these eight years. Um, and, uh, and also I was a VP research and acting VP research in University of Montreal. So I had that, you know, that, that, that uh, perspective coming from the, uh, the academia. And uh, uh, now I have the other one. I went to the other side of the force and I'm now part of the uh, funding agencies. Uh, my commitment to Erudzi really stem from uh, for, for a firm belief that uh, a conviction that was really built over time that we need that infrastructure for humanities and social sciences for publishing and I'll come back to the need for that uh, infrastructure and I think that the collaboration between Erudzi and PKP uh, provides really the essential tools that are needed uh, by the community to build that innovative uh, future. Um, I guess I have this here. Wait a second. The technology. So um, this was published a few months by, you must all know, the, uh, the Pile Dyer and Deeper uh, comic uh, strip. And this was published a few months after I arrived uh, at Shirk. And I shared it with my directors because that was so much the perspective that I lived when I was in Erudzi. Like, oh no, the funding agency agent is coming to visit. <laughs> and then we had to you know, write that big grant proposal and report that everything was going so well and everything. So uh, that was a dog and pony show that we uh, usually, so today I feel like I'm the funding agent that is coming uh, <laughs> to check on what's happening in the project. So I used to be on that research side with Erudzi and PKP looking for funds, uh, having personnel to support, tweaking when not inventing ideas to better fit with the funding opportunities, uh, creating collaborations on the go that were so extraordinary, filling form, raging against forms, guidelines, evaluation criteria, uh, discovering the night before the deadline that the summary was not following the guidelines, uh, promising the world and almost scared when we got the funding. You know, have you ever felt that? You get the funding and said, oh no, what did I write? And you go back to your proposal and say, oh my God, I did promise that. So uh, now I'm on the other side, and um, uh, I had that impression when I was uh, with Erudzi and even at the university that the government knew where they were going that they had a vision and that they knew what they wanted to fund and, uh, and, and that they just had to do it, you know, that they could organize the stakeholders. Uh, government funding agencies are mostly listening to the noise in the community. They try to make sense of all the opinions and I should say the conflicting opinions that come to our ears. And we try to think of mechanisms that are as fair as possible for the entire community, but that, that will have at the same time some sort of incentive to support innovation and creativity. So noise is good, make noise, make more noise, and repeat a lot of times because that's the only way that they hear uh, what's, what, what they should do. 
So where does uh, Shirk fit? So not everybody in this room probably knows what Shirk is or stands for. So Shirk is the Social Science Humanities Research Council. Uh, and where do they fit in the publishing environment? That's a question I've been asking myself since I arrived at Shirk, coming from University of Montreal and Erudzi. I thought, great, I'm going, uh, I'm going to be able to do things and influence, uh, influence the publishing uh, world and everything. So uh, I said, well, maybe I should first learn exactly what kind of tools I have to work with, and that's uh, the uh, the only slide that I'll impose on you on uh, what Shirk is. But it summarizes the how Shirk. Is is organized. Uh, we organize ourselves around three funding opportunities. We call it three programs, the talent, the insight, and the connection. Talent is pretty uh, explanatory by itself. We fund scholarships and fellowships. We fund people. Uh, insight, we fund research grants, obviously, and support to institutions for smaller grants, but it's also grants to researchers. And connection, it's about the mobilization, the flow of exchange, the mobilization of knowledge. So that would be where the support for journals uh, fit uh, in that. Uh, so we have about 30, 350 millions of funding, grants and scholarship uh, for social science humanities. I do manage another 500 millions of uh, tri-council funding, but it's essentially for lar large scale infrastructure programs that uh, do not touch as much social science and humanities. So where, where you can see where the support for publishing fits. Uh, it's a very small funding opportunity. Um, just switch there. So uh, we call it the Aid to Scholarly Journal. Uh, it's about, uh, this is a support to journal that has been uh, going on since 1979. The current funding opportunity is called Aid to Scholarly Journal. It was launched in 2008. Uh, and we award barely uh, about, uh, for a three-year period, 10.2 million to 144 journals in Canada. So that's, a, that's less than 3.4 million a year that we uh, distribute to journals. So that would be about 1% of our grants budget, or 0.05% if I look at all of my granting activities at Shirk. So it's very, very small. All the rest that we're funding is, in fact, projects. Everything that Shirks funds has a beginning, an end, deliverables, and you're supposed to start again with a new project. So that makes the uh, Aid to uh, Scholarly Journal a bit of an idiosyncrasy already within Shirk because it's not project, it's a very small budget. Imagine the difficulty of reviewing the quality of a journal as compared to a research project. All of our reviewers say the same thing. It's extremely difficult. How do you fund them? How do you establish the budget? What, what is the model for funding a... Uh, for funding a journal, um, they were telling me a bit, uh, I told them, why don't you just give them an amount and everything? And they said, well, before, we told them, send us a complete budget and tell us how much money we have and we sort of, we're sort of will uh, we'll fund the deficit. And at some point, everybody was just increasing the deficit and increasing the budget just to make sure that it would get more money. So it's extremely difficult just to devise how to fund uh, a journal. It's a very highly heterogeneous group. Uh, the business models are, are, are different. The delivery, uh, the disciplines, uh, the variety of disciplines makes, uh, makes that it's all kinds of different journals, long articles, short articles, letters, reviews. Um, also, well, the, the only thing that we can really see that is a trend in our journal, because you see from the, uh, the, the subscription and, and uh, open access moving wall, there's a small difference between two 2011 and 2014, but overall the, re the dependence to subscription is still very high. And if you look at the, uh, the only thing that we can see is really a trend is that we are really seeing uh, a trend towards, of course, digital uh, journals, but there are still a lot of journals that want to publish in paper and there's a lot of distribution of paper journals uh, in Canada still. So this uh, funding opportunity has not been reviewed in the last 10 years, and there's enough noise in the community regarding uh, publishing and the, uh, the, the general state of the environment, of the publishing environment, that we thought that it would be a good time to do some, uh, some review of the opportunity and try to find, but keeping in mind that it's only three millions a year, which means that we can't do much uh, with that. So we participated in a series uh, Erudzi led with partners a uh, consultations regarding the socioeconomic situation of Canadian journals. 
uh, and we also participated, participated by the College Initiatives uh, Canadian Scholarly Publishing Working Group that uh, took place in 2016. And uh, this year we put uh, together an advisory committee of which uh, Jean-Claude is part and uh, contributed uh, his ideas last week and we were all impressed with his contribution. So I just take the opportunity to wish him the best in his, uh, in his recovery. We look forward uh, to continue to work with him on that. Uh, essentially, the uh, you know it's a what came what comes out from that, and we're trying to make sense of uh, everything that's coming in uh, from that is that there's a very high quality uh, publishing enterprise uh, in Canada. Uh, and it's extremely important to maintain that publishing enterprise essentially also for you know regional topics versus national topics versus international topics. We have some uh, regional journals that are extremely important uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, and this is a uh, this is a system that builds on existing strength. There's a there's a a good, a good group of stakeholders that are committed to make it work. It's rather flexible and adaptable, and it offers uh, also opportunities in, uh, in training and ed editorial practices. So over that, there's, there's something to build on, but there are some clear challenges that, uh, that we're facing. One of the first, you know, it's a, uh, one of the first challenge that, uh, that we're facing at this um, at this point is uh, is around the the, uh, the open access i mix my here it is uh, is is around the open access you know it's a uh, there's a vision there's a policy that was uh, that was adopted and that was uh, published by the tri council by the tri council it means that it it also covers uh, the health sciences and it also covers science and engineering so they all had to agree on an open access policy and they finally uh, managed to say okay let's go for 12 months uh, they consulted for a year or two years uh, but then they went for a 12 month uh, obligation to uh, put in the public environment any publication that is uh, arising from supported research from uh, the Tri Council. So that's uh, that's all nice. We have now a policy. Uh, it is not enforced, so we do not check if uh, this is uh, being uh, done or not. Uh, the reality uh, from the three sectors is uh, really different. Obviously, from, uh, from our perspective, uh, it's pretty obvious why we're supporting open access. It's a priority of the government. It is public funding. So it makes sense that uh, any research that's being uh, done with public funding would be made accessible. But at the same time, it adds some uh, drawbacks and some feedback, negative feedbacks towards the agency because now what was supposed to be open access and reduce the cost is now becoming an important eligible expense in all the grants budget and is taking a large chunk of money from the researchers budget so that they could pay for these uh, for, for that gold access uh, in the commercial world so there's added expenses uh, from our sides that we, we can really see uh, this increase in the in, in this expense and the university side um, there doesn't seem to have a, a, a positive impact on the subscription costs if you see positive by reducing them <laughs> because they have only increased a since uh, the appearance of the open access trend. Uh, it's still interesting initiatives for the libraries, obviously, uh, but there's added cost because of all the, um, all the data management and the contribution that they can make to the mobilization of knowledge, but it's still added cost due to the need for the repositories. Uh, and from the research side, I can, uh, from the conversation that I had with the researchers, I can say that it, cre it can create profound angst on what it means, open access, and what's the impact on their own research, and the fact that it reduces the flexibility on the way that they want to publish and distribute their, um, so we hear it everywhere. So open access is not a solution to all, obviously. Um, we, still, you, we obviously still need a vehicle to publish. We still need the vetting process. We still need the editorial activities. Uh, open access is just, you know, some sort of a, an added constraint that we have that, add, um, add that, that we're adding to the system. And to be honest, that we're not supporting at the same time. We just add the constraint, but I have to admit that the funding agencies do not support for the moment that move towards uh, open access. Uh, another uh, an another big concern, and uh, you know, it's, uh, 
it's it's not documented and everything, but you can see that from the from the, the funding agency perspective, it's sort of a what the heck are we doing in that world? You know, when you see the commercial interests that are playing right now, when you see the the scam publishing that is increasing, when you hear about that the peer review system is broken and that some researchers are you know doing things but others are not and how are they how is the system organizing and for these reasons and others obviously the internationalization of the uh, of research in general our fellow agencies whether it's NSERC or CIHR have just decided to remove themselves from this uh, this publishing uh, business which means that important topics for Canada uh, are just you know have Find, difficult to find home for publishing for these topics, uh, though for their, they consider that for their sectors it's not as important. Obviously for humanities and social sciences that's not where we are going, but I can tell you that there's a real concern in the funding agencies that they shouldn't be involved in that publishing enterprise in general because of, I guess, the instability of it and of the big commercial uh, interests that are there that are way stronger than whatever the government could invest uh, in such a system to make it different. Uh, at the same time, uh, we hear from the community very interesting perspective about what is a journal, what's the purpose of a journal. And I was talking about Jean-Claude, but he presented the conference at ACFAS uh, last May that I had the pleasure to, to listen to. And he was really trying to redefine the journals as it was initially thought. The journal was a way initially to communicate between researchers that knew each other and that needed to exchange their uh, their result. Uh, nowadays, it has more or less become a uh, credential for, up to, for, for, uh, for obtaining your tenure in, acad in an academic career. But, but to come back to that, uh, that collaboration journal, we need to be able to support uh, innovative uh, uh, initiatives that would transform the, those journals into collaborative platforms. And this is already happening with what PKP is doing, with what plenty of researchers are trying by, la by launching these uh, small initiatives, bringing the researchers around common topics. So as a funding agency, we, we hear about it and we need to better adjust to be able to recognize uh, those, uh, those initiatives. Um, this is our ecosystem that uh, my friends uh, will recognize uh, and that we are facing. I mean, uh, one of the things that we hear from the, uh, from the journal is that the journal, the funding to a journal is too discreet. I mean, it's a small unit that is independent from the others and more than independent, it is isolated from the others. And to get them to work together, to share the resources, to share the expertise is extremely difficult. And because of that, we're lacking an opportunity for innovation for, the, for those journals. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it impedes directly in their, uh, in their international impact and in their way of being uh, mobilized around the world. So um, this is something that we heard from uh, everybody that we talked to, that we need to find a way to have an organization that would be able to uh, to, to support the innovation part uh, of this journal, but in a, in, a, in a group way instead of an isolated way. Uh, theoretically, just to give you an idea of the uh, environment, SHRC does not offer any infrastructure funding. I was telling you we only fund projects. But there is a lot of other opportunities in the, uh, in the Canadian ecosystem. Uh, CFI has, uh, is covering what we call the innovation uh, realm, uh, though it derives mostly from the, the STEM world, so it's, uh, it's designed and planned to support large-scale infrastructure. If you want to buy a microscope, it's pretty easy to go there. If you want to build a database uh, on journals, uh, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, Erudit PKP still managed uh, to do it, so they all know these uh, acronyms and these, uh, these programs. So it's possible to, uh, to build your infrastructure, to get money to build the infrastructure. You can even get some, uh, some operation money from the major science, uh, scientific infrastructure that uh, PKP and Erudit got. So 
they, they've got some operating money uh, on that. But but how how do you bring that to the journal, and how do you offer uh, services? Then is the uh, is sort of the gap. It's uh, it's just like if we have you know you have conversation coming from two sides. You have the small journal who says I want some support, and you have that 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 community that organizes itself that we're offering support and how do we how do we make them talk together and how do we support that conversation um, so we, are, we do identify that gap. We need to think about the solution. Uh, is it more funding? Is it a different way of funding? Is it rather recognition and designation of national facilities? Uh, it's all kind of questions that we need uh, to, uh, we need to address. Uh, agencies will create program on, if they feel there's an opportunity, only if they have to, uh, if there's a gap in the system and if it fits their mandates. So it's, uh, it's a long road before we, we fund, uh, we create a new program. Uh, I, might, I might mention for, for the people in the room, you know, that are familiar with that, I mentioned an historical exception where SHRC has been funding a pan-Canadian pan network infrastructure for many years before CFI uh, that was dedicated to research data centers, which is pretty much uh, very similar to what uh, the group is doing, Iridian PKP, and only recently did CFI recognize them as a major scientific infrastructure. Uh, SHRC continues to support that national infrastructure uh, that rallies all the universities and researchers in Canada. And we even, uh, we even manage the vetting process of the research projects that are being led on that infrastructure. So that's also indication that things can be done when everybody rallies uh, around a, a, a common goal. I think there's, a, just to finish, I think there's a lot of opportunities in Canada right now to, uh, to move things. Uh, there's been what we call the Naylor Report, which was in fact this, uh, this uh, fundamental science review that was led by David Naylor, and that uh, the, report, the report was published uh, last April, and we're waiting for the government response. So I'm part of the government, so I'm waiting for my minister to tell me that I can respond to the Naylor Report. <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs> Uh, but still in the Naylor report, there's clear indication and the community uh, is really rallying behind the report. There's clear indication that there needs to be uh, further investments in the funding agency towards fundamental science. So new money always means uh, the moment to, uh, for budget ask, I would uh, think. Uh, um, our government also reinvested for a two-year period in the Leadership Council for the Digital Research Infrastructure. Uh, that was sort of a consortium of all kinds of stakeholders across Canada that were trying to um, find the best solution to support all the digital infrastructure that is uh, being developed in Canada in isolated ways, which is, of course, uh, what happened with Irudzi PKP initially, and how we could all bring this together. So that's an opportunity to get involved there and have uh, your voice heard uh, at that place. Uh, there's also a new CIO at the government. That seems pretty, uh, pretty far, but uh, it's a young CIO that comes from the museum world. Uh, it's very rare to see that in the government, and he's all about open API, open source, and he wants the government to move. So anything that departments and ministers and agencies would do that go in what he's saying. So I do invite you to uh, maybe talk to him and to uh, get involved with him because he's really interesting. And it is a shirk priority also uh, to support uh, digital scholarship uh, in general. Uh, we're launching a consultation on data management uh, pretty soon, uh, next uh, fall. So I think, again, that is very closely linked to the activities that uh, PKP is uh, doing. So uh, I guess for conclusion, the only thing I could say is that uh, we do hear that there are some challenges in the community. Uh, we think that there's, uh, we need to discuss, you know, to find the best ways, but I think that the, uh, the most important asset that uh, we have in Canada is that collaboration between, uh, and I'm of course totally biased, but it's <laughs> that existing infrastructure that is already internationally recognized, well networked, and we need to rally behind and to make sure that uh, we can use it to the best uh, with, uh, capacity. So thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity and I welcome uh, any questions. Tania, est-ce que tu fais l'animation? Yes. Maybe you can name yourself because I can't see yeah. too much with the light. Yeah, hi, I'm Chuck Kosher from Crossref. And um, 
I've been involved in some discussions recently where the notion that funding agencies can replace or supplant peer review. And the thinking being, since funding agencies uh, select and vet the research and monitor the research, that the resultant literature will, of course, be of high quality. And so what's the need for peer review? Can you say something on that? Journal peer review, you would say? Uh, pardon? You would talk about journal peer review instead yeah, jur of not jur grants peer review, obviously? Correct. That yeah. journal peer review is not necessary. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, more or less, it's in some cases, in some fields, some sectors, it's more or less already happening, you know, because uh, uh, the readership of some journals, you, you, might, you might do the peer review of the article, but the readership of the article is uh, sometimes pretty limited. Uh, so at some point, uh, you do wonder, you know, if, if is that, that, that all that process really needed? Because if an article is going to be read, uh, we're going to know if the com from the comments if it's positive or not. Um, it's not... We can't, as a funding agency, it's impossible to guarantee the quality of the research that's going to be done. I mean, we're only vetting on a proposal, on something that is coming in the future. And I think the community needs, if the peer review at the journal level is not what they want anymore, fine, but they need to find another way to recognize what is good and not good results, because uh, we're only vetting the proposal. And from the humanities and social science perspective, uh, I'm funding no more than 20% of my community. So there's plenty of research out there that is not funded and that, that has not gone through an agency process. Hey Dominic, thanks for those thanks comments. It was very interesting to hear the <laughs> how you're thinking about things uh, morphing, and I was particularly interested in your thoughts about how the journal um, has to open up and change and become um, something that, that it couldn't be with um, print technologies. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in new forms of scholarly publication, and um, Shirk, as you say, has been uniquely supporting um, the infrastructure for journals on a project basis for years. There's no funding stream for supporting new form digital scholarly publication. So I guess my thought is, or my question is, what are your thoughts on um, what Shirk should do in response to this um, situation? Should the, um, there's the Aid to Scholarly Journals um, program um, from the Federation, there's Shirk funding, um, Sorry, there's an aid, aid to the monograph program in, in um, FedCan, and then there's journals within Shirk. Where does new form scholarly publication fit? Is it that our definition of journals should really expand? Does there need to be a new funding stream? Do you have thoughts on what should happen there? Yeah. As I was mentioning, you know, it's a uh, new funding stream. We like to tweak things. That's what I learned from the government. They like to tweak instead of creating new forms. Every time that we're experimenting, you know, we've got, we've got plenty of funding opportunities to experiment. You can go to Connection. There's going to be a new funding for partnerships and everything. So you can always experiment. The problem is when you want to do a recurring funding for such an initiative. My proposal to, uh, to Shirk, uh, but it has its drawbacks, essentially financial, would be to uh, change the word journals to platforms. I mean, at some point, uh, scholarly aid to scholarly platforms and uh, open up the definition of what is platform and what kind of, and, and expand, the, not just art publishing articles, but it could be all other kinds of platforms. The drawbacks to that is that there's a limited pool of money, and uh, although the success rate is now 73% for the actual journals, anything lower for them would be critical for the community. So that's why the investment of money would be interesting. And from my perspective, and I'm really not talking for Shirk, but really my position in Shirk, and I, uh, I want, is that if there's money that comes in, I've got way more chance to attract money towards such an initiatives uh, around scholarly uh, collaboration, around new digital platforms, than to invest more in the traditional practice of publishing that, uh, that is facing so many challenges uh, right now. Um, 
Thank you for that. I, I actually found your talk very, very interesting, and I was even really uh, happy to have Susan's question because I'm actually pulling it back. I, I want to ask you again about the aid to scholarly uh, journals. That's something, a program that I've uh, been following for, for several years. I keep my eye on your website to see if there's going to be a new iteration of that. It was last time was 2014, and I have many journals that want to flip and don't have any money and don't have any funds. Yep. But you were talking about how you're really um, wanting to uh, support the group and not the isolated journal itself. So I'm wondering if you could maybe update us on if there are any plans, because it looks like from the website that there will be a new version of that um, program, mm -hmm. and if it will allow those smaller journals who have no funding to flip um, into yeah. an OJS program. Thank uh, you. Answer is yes. We just delayed by a year the uh, the, fund, the the competition just to uh, allow us the time to consult with the community and to finish, you know, the participation to these uh, to these groups that were ongoing and everything. So the competition is going to be launched uh, probably in January, and I think the deadline is in June. And obviously, it's open to new journals uh, like uh, like any other uh, competition, whether it's OJS or uh, other kinds of uh, of, uh, of distribution. Uh, regarding the the capacity. It's been it's been requests that we've received from uh, varying uh, horizons uh, for the creation of uh, the yeah the creation of a group that would be uh, able to offer innovation services uh, to journal. Uh, instead of uh, you know giving more money to each separate journal because obviously it's too complicated for an individual journal to uh, to uh, travel in that realm you know of uh, of technology, but. Uh, before creating a new group, uh, first it's not our it's not our job to create a group. I mean, it's the com if the community wants to create a group, fine, <laughs> they can always create a group and then ask for funding, uh, convince us that uh, we should fund them. But there there might, uh, as I mentioned, uh, be already groups in the ecosystem that could do the job. <laughs> yes, Dominique, John. thanks so much for the for the talk. It's wonderful to get some insight uh, and connections and some talent. Uh, in terms of Shirk, um, I want to be part of the community noise issue that you invited earlier and said was important, and uh, so I want to talk a bit about a more radical um, thinking about this. The, the biggest challenge, I think, in the social sciences and humanities today is the APC and open access. Um, it is, there's no question that APC is a financial success for open access. There's no question that it is an established economic model compared to everything else. And so we're seeing increasing pressure from the big publishers to move into an APC model if you want open access. Uh, and we think in the social sciences and humanities that's just not a starter. So one of the ways that at least we've been thinking about, and I want to add to the noise, um, is the idea of direct funding from the agencies. You said that Shirk didn't have a model for supporting open access apart from the journal subventions. Um, so the idea that everyone who receives a Shirk grant would be able to publish wherever they want uh, and that Shirk would pay the publishers directly for any publications coming from that research. Um, that would only take care of 20% of Canada's output from what you said about Shirk funding about 20% of the social sciences and humanity community. Um, so there would still be that 80%, um, but that, uh, for some of us at least, could fall to the libraries, that the libraries could flip their subscriptions, I'm just trying to give you, a, a, in a few minutes, a, an encapsulated model that shakes up the thinking. That Shirk could become involved and say, this is the research that we think is most, the most exciting in Canada, and wherever it's published, we want to see it reach the world in an open access format. And rather than handling APCs out to only 20% of the community, you would just fund that research directly and work with the libraries in Canada to see about supporting the part that isn't funded. So, as noise goes, <laughs> um, I agree with the. Uh, I agree that the APC is one of the biggest problem uh, that we're facing with the open access. Uh, uh, we could always, you know, in the uh, aid to scholarly as a pair, and I'll go to your second part of the second part of your question afterwards because the first part is easier. And <laughs> we could uh, we, we could always in the aid to scholarly journals, you know. Um, say that we don't fund journals that use APC or we don't fund journals that are on commercial platforms and things like that. So that would be, but that would only affect the one in 44 journals, you know, that we fund uh, in Canada. So I'm not sure if that's sufficient to make a, a big difference. In fact, I know it's not sufficient. It's just, a, it's just a, 
it's it's a nice gesture, but it's it, it won't be sufficient to uh, to influence. Regarding what you're proposing, I guess it's uh, I group that and all the I group because we had the opportunity to talk uh, about that model of yours that is really interesting also, and I, I group that in the uh, the creation of groups you know that could manage that for Shirk sure, because it's extremely difficult to imagine Shirk managing payments, individual payments to journals that publish articles coming from. So we need somebody between, you know, we need a broker that's going to be able to do it uh, for sure. And we could and Orchid could be lovely brokers in that regard. Fine. <laughs> that's a good idea. We need brokers that can, you know, we need we need these the we need that empowerment of the community that can manage the manage it because at the individual level it's not possible for a government to do it, you know. No, I understand. Yeah. But are, are we thinking at that level of, radic of proposals so that, that if we got together with Crossref and, Sh and ORCID uh, and came forward with a group of journals that we could begin that kind of discussion? I think it needs to be discussed, yeah. Okay. <laughs> From noise to music, thank you. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Uh, Dominique, I was wondering, before you said that uh, there is consciousness that the government, <coughs> sorry, that, um, that the commercial publishers are very powerful and that there's a lot of money behind it and so on, <clears throat> but I think in Canada we have the opportunity of uh, building some kind of a national initiative. There is like, because of the territory and the culture and so on, uh, there are very much of similarities with what is going on in Europe in some countries and in the European uh, Union. So there are projects where uh, there is a national support and national in initiatives in order to make uh, this switch or make open access initiatives happen. So in these uh, review of the program and, and looking forward you know, to change culture and so on, I was wondering at what point are you looking at these initiatives and in what point are you seeing parallels that could be possible in Canada uh, to see if there won't be able, if we won't be able to, to have a national system where we support with, uh, uh, and ha to have in mind what you mentioned before that PKP and RED are there as national infrastructure already in place. So we can talk about Crossref and ORCID as brokers, but I think we also have Canadian uh, infrastructure there that could do this kind of jobs. Well, there's a lot of groups, you know, that are uh, in the ecosystem. It's a pretty, uh, in that sense, it's a pretty sane ecosystem because of the, the numbers of stakeholders that uh, wanted to, but at the same time, because it's a, when you only have one group or one stakeholder, it's never good. And that's something that, that as a funding agency, you would never want, you know, to have a just one, uh, one organization that controls everything because obviously uh, we see the challenges, you know, when you look at how Compute Canada is working at the national level, it's always a bit complicated when you have when you force everybody to work within one organization you have to make sure that that, that organization works really really well because uh, otherwise uh, you're gonna pay uh, you're gonna pay afterwards for for that decision um, of course we're interested I mean it's a I have to uh, I have to be transparent you know but the knowledge within the uh, the agencies about the publishing world and about uh, the international stakeholders and who's who and who's doing what and their understanding of the technology is really low. Uh, this is not their daily business. Their daily business is to manage competition, to find reviewers, to organize the peer review, to award the money, uh, to receive the reports, and then to do it again. So their understanding of, what, of the general ecosystem is not to the level that is needed to take those kinds of decisions. So don't assume that they understand. Uh, they count on the researchers and they count on the community to organize themselves and to demonstrate that they can do it before they give the money, that they are confident enough that they can give the money. So that's, that's the, there's a bit of a difference there. <laughs> well, thank you so much and I uh, look forward to hearing all the presentations today. You have four minutes, which is much shorter than me, <laughs> and good luck. <laughs>